You're listening to the Millennials Choice Show, Canada's most trusted podcast on all things real estate, finance, and entrepreneurship. Here's your host, Matthew Ablican. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Millennials Choice Show. It's Matthew Ablican here with Danny Ablican. What's going on, guys? What's going on, brother? So, guys, we have some good news. Uh, it depends how you look at it, but it is good news because the Bank of Canada held their rate this week. Uh, they had an announcement a couple days ago on January 24th, and they have held it steady. Also, their discussions internally, this is from a Globe and Mail article that's quoting the Bank of Canada governor, the discussions have shifted away from further hikes. So they're putting it out there that there's this like positive outlook in the market that they are pretty confident they're going to start cutting the rates. It seems like that's the direction they're headed. It seems like that's the direction most economists, most, you know, CEOs of real estate companies, most everybody thinks is going to happen. Rates are going to start to cut in 2024, starting in Q2. Danny, thoughts? Guys, you're probably seeing so many videos on Instagram of realtors saying Bank of Canada holds its rates, blah, 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 and just not really getting into it and what it means for you, the borrower, the person that has a variable rate mortgage, the person that's looking to get into the market. And we're going to dissect that. We're going to jump into it. We're going to talk about it right now and what it means for you guys and how it could help you guys you know, achieve your financial dreams of owning a home or owning rental properties. So I'm excited. This is amazing news, especially for me. I have a variable. I've had the variable. And I <laughs> held on to the variable for a little over a year. And you know what this feels oh. like, guys? This feels like victory. Okay. This feels like victory. And I'm not going to celebrate too early because I want to celebrate when the rates come down further. I can't believe um, that you are still on that. You made such a bad financial decision. <laughs> I'm going to tell it like it is. You held on to too much pride and you've been eating that pride for the last two years. I'll eat that 7% for one. It's only been a year, but I, I, I eat that 7% for a year. But guess what? For the next you know three and a half years or so, once the rates come down, you know, let's say summer this year, I'm going to be at a cool probably 5%, 4%. I won't lock in at five. No, I'm too greedy. I need to lock in at like 4%. So, well, when you locked into your, well, when you went into your variable, the rates were already in the fives. You could have done that this entire time. I so could have done a high five. So, you need, to, so yeah. you need to do the cost savings analysis that I know you didn't do for yourself and figure <laughs> out if you actually come out ahead. Why would I have locked in at f high fives, 5.9 or whatever the case was back then? When right now I'm gonna definitely lock into four, and then you don't know that. Yeah, when you average it out over the next three years, you don't know that it's probably gonna go down to like I, not end of this year. You I don't think don't it's gonna hit. Know I don't think the rates that. are gonna hit four percent end of 2024. But mark my words, 2025, you're definitely gonna see the fours. The beautiful hey, number four. You made a bold prediction a couple of years ago. You were wrong. Let's see if this prediction pays out for you. <laughs> uh, I'm a fixed rate kind of guy. I like my peace of mind. I don't get greedy. I make conservative choices because I look at them in a long with a long-term mindset over 20, 30 years. And locking in with peace of mind would be a drop in the bucket compared to eating a higher rate like you have been eating for the last two years. So hopefully it, it pays out for you. It'll only make it sweeter, man. I Listen, I hope so. <laughs> but reading an excerpt from the Globe and Mail article, the Bank of Canada has held its policy interest rate steady for the fourth consecutive time. And they have said that monetary policy discussions have shifted from whether to raise borrowing costs further to how long the banks the bank should wait before lowering them now that the Canadian economy has shifted into a state of excess supply. So what it's saying is that the economy has slowed down. And we've seen that. We've seen that happen in Canada so now they're just deciding whether it's, is it time to decrease their rates or do we still keep it the same? When will the time be for them to decrease the rates? What this tells me, first of all, we have to take their word for face value, right? We're not going to say you can't trust them. You don't know. They said this before and they did something else. We, we don't know, right? But we have to take them at their word, right? Yeah. And so if they're telling us that this is 
the situation that we're in, in that the economy slowed down, there's excess supply, there's not that much consumer spending is basically what they're saying. It's only a matter of time from what I'm reading that the rates are going to start going down. So chances are that the rates are going to go down. That's where it's headed towards. What this means for you as real estate investors or people that want to get into the market, well, maybe the days of good deals are coming to an end because supply is going to remain low when it comes to housing because we've always had a supply and demand issue. We have lots of immigration. We don't have enough housing being built to satisfy all the demand. We have the older generation, the baby boomers, and the generation that comes after them. I think that's Gen X, right? Yeah. Gen X after baby boomers. Gen X, I mean, Gen X, they're still younger, young, fairly young, but the baby boomers are staying in their homes longer. Mm. So this is putting a, a, a crunch on supply, right? That's why we had so many bidding wars in early 2022, also in 2021, when rates were super low because there just isn't enough supply, guys. So if what these guys are saying, if the Bank of Canada and these economy and everything, everyone who's predicting that rates are going to come lower and Bank of Canada stays true to their word and now the rates start to decrease later this year in 2024, we may become a seller's market again. And it's it seems like all signs are pointing to it. I have a question. Do you think that when they do cut the rates, because I think they will cut the rates just a matter of time, when they cut the rates, do you think the market is going to shoot up and spike immediately, like right away, and it's going to be a bidding wars, wild, wild <clears throat> west, like 2021, 2022, early 2022? Do you think it's going to be like that? Or do you think things are going to kind of stabilize when it comes to prices? What are your thoughts? I'm it's curious. Very, you know, I thought I've been thinking about this. It's great. It's funny that you asked me that. I thought about that because Ray Dalio said something that really has stuck with me where he said that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that the times ahead, when, this is from an investment standpoint, times ahead will be the same as times in the past. Mm. Like history repeats itself. That's not always true. As an example, when the Great Depression happened and the stock market collapsed, people thought this was the time to buy because in two years it was going to bounce back. It didn't bounce back for many, many years. Mm -hmm. It didn't come back. So it took longer to do that. I'm a little bit torn. I don't know how to answer your question. I'm a little bit torn because I, although I think that at the beginning, like let's say, let's say Bank of Canada in March, their next announcement says we're going to, decrease the rates now a quarter basis point. I'm torn between whether that's going to create like this immediate spike in the market mm. or a slow progression up mm. because people are going to still maybe want to wait for the rates to get lower. Some people still don't qualify. They can't afford to get a mortgage. Even if the rates goes, goes down a little bit, they still have to wait till the rates go down quite significantly because remember, it went up so much so quickly that there's going to be a lot of people sidelined just because they can't afford to buy. So I'm torn between that or I'm the other side of the argument where in certain pockets right now, like in, in certain pockets of Toronto, for example, there are bidding wars right now while the rates have been the highest they've ever been. Mm. So I could only assume that if the rates go down, that there will be more, you know, uh, bidding wars take place. Yeah. I could only assume because it's happening now. So if the rates go down, that just means people can afford more. And more people will come to the to the market, especially in those pockets. I think we're gonna start to see this this new trend of geographic like sub markets playing out differently across different cities and different property types. I think we're gonna see more of that, where you'll see some markets perform way better than others. It's always been like that, but I think more so now on a micro level, you're gonna see certain markets really perform, and it, it'll be like February 2022. And then you'll see other markets that that don't perform as well, even though the rates came down. I think there's going to be like a combination of both. I definitely would have to say I agree with you, especially regarding, you know, certain markets like geographically doing better than others or not necessarily doing better, but just spiking. Um, also, a huge emphasis, I think, should be put on certain property types. Um, mm. I personally think that the detached homes you know, where people need the space for families and, you know, people growing and whatnot, 
will see a huge significant spike as opposed to maybe condos personally because uh, I think there's going to be a lot more demand for, for those kind of homes. Um, on the other hand, condos are also in high demand because they're the most affordable. So it's tough to really say, right? I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, also, at the same time, with that being said, condos also might spike in certain areas because when the rates come down, as we've discussed before many times, guys, we have a stress test rule here in Canada to qualify for a mortgage. So when you're qualifying for a mortgage, you have to get a mortgage of, let's say you get a mortgage of 4%. The rates come down 4% now. You have to still qualify at 6%, Mm -hmm. which means you're still not going to be able to have as much purchasing power as you used to before the stress test. And so, you know, what's the next best thing better than, let's say, renting this? If you want to own property, you own a condo, right? If you're not able to afford a townhome, right? Or a detached home or semi-detached home. So I also think that's also a potential. I think that no one, I don't really haven't heard anyone talk about this. I think there might be rules that might get implemented to kind of still soften the market when the rates come down. They might increase the the restrictions on qualifying for a mortgage so that the market doesn't just, you know, spike and shoot through the roof and cause all these bidding wars to happen. The government might step in and be like, listen, the rates are down now, but we still need to kind of play, you know, control, you know, the demand, you know, we got to tame the demand. I still think that's a huge possibility that's kind of creeping up. No one's really talking about it. I think that could happen and that'll stop potential buyers from still getting in. But at the same time, the people that are in that have mortgages are going to extremely benefit from the lowered rates when the Bank of Canada does reduce their rates. But that that always happens, right? Like this stress test that Danny's talking about, like that came into effect in 2018. And it affects obviously the entire market. But if you're an investor, chances are you know what you're doing. You've got money. You know how to invest. You've got the right people around you. You still circumvent that. Whereas the everyday person on a fixed salaried income... Their, their purchasing power is automatically diminished. And who gets affected the most by this? First-time home buyers. Oh, for sure. That's why we tell you guys, get your foot in the door. Doesn't matter really what you get your foot in the door with. It's just get in the door because the first-time home buyers are what get impacted the most. So when there's a stress test, for example, or if they say your amortization is capped, meaning how long you have to pay off the mortgage goes from 40 years, which it once was, to 30 and then 25 well, that just takes away your ability to qualify. Yep. It, it limits it even more than it was before. So it affects that kind of segment of the population. But I think to counter what you're saying, I think there needs to be a balance mm-hmm. because they also don't want to completely curb demand, but there might be measures put in place to do that where they you know, curb demand a little bit. But then on the flip side of it, I'm seeing positive talks about them putting out certain regulations and rules that actually will help homeowners. Meaning, like as an example, they might extend amortizations. So right now, people on a variable rate, where the variable rate's been going up significantly over the last two years, some people have amortizations of like 67 years. Mine's like 71 years right now. Yours is 71 years. Mine's seven, I was on so, the RBC up 71 years. So basically, if your rate was the way it is now, and your payments didn't change, it would take you 71 years to pay off your mortgage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the thing is, you're not allowed to be in that situation. The banks are the banks cap you at 30 years, in your case, because you put 20% down, right? Yeah. So 30 years is your cap. Some lenders will go to 35, but 30 to 35 is the cap. How are you at 71? That's just the way the interest rate works. So because your mortgage is not in negative... Basically, exactly. We're just they, at the cost. If you're they at the increased cost. it again, we would have had to make exactly. a payment. And or I something. think they know that. Yeah. I think they know that. And remember, the banks don't want to be necessarily homeowners. They don't want to own property. They lend on property. I don't think they want to be landlords. They don't want to be landlords, in my opinion. And at the same time, they're not gonna want to renew those types of mortgages. Why would they? Why would they want to renew those types of mortgages? And have all these negative amortizations. People have balances owed higher than what they qualified for. It's not good for their books. So at the same time, they don't want to be landlords or homeowners or own property. But at the same time, they're not going to want to renew certain people, I think, that bought way too high and, you know, can't afford it. Yeah, it's like this fine balance, you know, it's this fine balance that has to take place. 
I think they, I think they may extend amortizations maybe to 40 years, maybe 45, but they'll come and they'll say, Hey, Danny, you know, your mortgage is up for renewal. You need to make this lump sum payment or increase your payment to this amount. And we'll give you the 45 year am or 40 year am, but not, we're not going to stick to 71 years. Yeah. You know, you'll be like, God willing, you live to a hundred, but you'll be dead by then. <laughs> for sure. You'll literally die at the day you pay your mortgage. Yeah. You, you know, you're 30 now. So, or 29. Yeah. 71 years, you'd be a hundred years old. That's Think crazy. about that. So they don't want that either. No. Yeah. They um, want their money sooner. So I think there's going to be this fine line of, of this balance. What I heard they wanted to do, and I think they they prolonged it, and, I, and we haven't heard from them since, is they wanted to, for example, for like investors or even on like refinances, especially on rental properties, instead of you being able to refinance to like 80% or 75%, depending on the property type, they were going to cap you at 65%, for example. Yeah. So there's things that they want to do, they could do, that's going to, you know, curb demand, make it a little harder, make it a little bit more trickier, change up the rule set of the real estate game, but you still could navigate it, but they, they could do certain things. We're not saying that like all options are on the table. There's you don't, so you much don't know. things. There's so much things they can do. And a lot of people don't know that the part about the renewal that the bank actually doesn't have to renew your mortgage for you. They don't know. People don't know that people think, Oh, well I got my mortgage once I'm guaranteed. I'm going to keep getting it. Well, no, if something happens and, you know, the bank doesn't want to renew their mortgage, they have the right, unfortunately, to not offer you renewal terms and conditions. And as a result, you'd have to go somewhere else and get a mortgage from them. Otherwise, you've got to come up with the money or sell your house. Exactly. So a lot of people don't know that. I don't think it's heading in that direction now uh, after the uh, rate announcement. I think the rates are going to be coming down. And as a result, the banks are going to, I think, loosen up, not tighten up because they've tightened up a lot these past couple of years. Have. Like I'll, even for those people that, that don't know, like we help people with uh, arranging mortgage financing as well. Uh, and it obviously as a bonus, in addition to helping our real estate clients, uh, making a smooth um, transaction. And a lot of times, like when we're speaking to these lenders, they're changing their rules, guys, like constantly. And they're doing it to mitigate risk, right? And oftentimes people don't know what's going on on the back end, but they're they're doing certain things that they normally wouldn't have done before to tighten up and you know restrict people from uh getting getting access to funds especially when you're trying to take out equity what happened to my mortgage when i was getting my mortgage recently a week and a half before the closing date they call rbc called me and they're like hey so like you're approved they still haven't sent me anything in writing they're like so as you know like you're approved but they're just finalizing everything um the underwriter said, there's one condition though, you have to pay out your car. And I'm like, what do you mean? Why would I have to pay off my car? Like you said, I was approved. Like this is from, you know, months back. And she's like, I know, but this is what she said. And this really pissed me off. This is happening, guys. She said, the underwriter saw that you were getting money from the sale of your condo. And the underwriter said, well, why would he keep that money? He should pay off the car with the money. And I'm making it a condition of the mortgage. So that doesn't make sense to me because I think we have the freedom here to do what we, to be able to do uh, what we want with our money and not have to you know pay out a car for example and you don't want to. Reason why I'm giving this example out is they're doing stuff like that that they wouldn't normally do before, wouldn't have to do before. But why is that person doing that? So it mitigates risk on the file. So she can go to her superiors and say, you know that file it was very risky. You know, I was able to make it very conservative for us. I got him to pay out his car. Yeah, Which and is, I, you know, doesn't make sense to me as a borrower, no. but at the same time, you have to understand the system and what's happening. Yeah. And the other thing is you wanted to get a mortgage with the A lender. You could have went to a B lender. They wouldn't have required you to do that, but yeah. you would have paid a little bit more. And obviously with some strategic advice your big bro gave you, <laughs> it actually worked out in your best interest to do that. 100%. Yeah. Right. With a way you didn't, an angle you didn't see before. Right. Yeah, definitely. So, so the thing is, it's like, sometimes you have to do what you have to do. But at the same time, you're absolutely right. There are lenders that normally would do deals eyes closed, no problem, that are now pulling back on how much money they're lending, even private lenders, guys. We have private lenders where, buddy, private lenders, you know, we have Joe over there. He didn't care about what you do for a living, where you make your money, whatever. He'll give you the money. But if you don't pay him back, he's going to take your house. Yeah. Okay. Even, you know, Joe is just an example of a name. Right, Uncle Joel. Even Uncle Joe now is saying, 
you know, hold on. I feel like I want to mitigate my risk a little bit. Mm. A private lender charging 10%, 12% wants to mitigate their risk. But why I'm pointing that out as an example is the reason why they could charge 10 or 12% is because of the risk. So even they are now scaling back and wanting to see. However, interestingly enough, there are lenders in other provinces that want to come into Ontario and provide a better service and a better product. So what, what I learned, uh, Darren Hardy, one of my first coaches said, he's like, there's always new keys to the kingdom being crowned every single day. So when there's lenders here that are so in the business, in the market, that they can't take a step back and see what's really going on, they might lose market share. And then someone else will come and say, I'm comfortable with that. I've seen this before. I know how this plays out. Mm. We're well capitalized. We have a lot of liquid. We're ready to go. So I don't know. I just love real estate because look how much avenues that it leads to. There's the lending arm. There's the Mm. buying arm. There's the building arm. But what you guys need to know is with pre-construction real estate, how this plays a role is when the borrowing costs go up for you, when the Bank of Canada is raising rates, it's actually impacting everybody and every industry. How does it impact the builder? Well, the builder typically borrows money to construct their project, whether it's a single family home or whether it's a 20 story condo building, they borrow money to do that. It's a business they're in, right? If their cost of borrowing goes up, which it does when the Bank of Canada raises their rates, well, when the cost of borrowing goes up, then they have to pass that down to you, the buyer, because they need to make a profit. They're in business. Otherwise, why would they do it? Otherwise, why would they do it? Yeah. So the problem, the conundrum was that the prices have to go up, which is why you did not see at all pre-construction prices from builders for new projects go down. You didn't see it. The prices have to go up and then, and, and by the way, with that, there's taxes that went up. There's the cost to build. There's so many things, supply issues that factor into that. But cost of borrowing is one of them. It's a big one. Um, but you didn't see the prices go down for pre-construction, but because the builders couldn't sell at the high prices because the cost of borrowing went up, what did they do? Most of them waited and they're waiting now. They haven't launched new projects as many as they normally would because they had to wait. The buyer, the demand is, is sidelined right now. It's not there. So that's another big factor to consider with this, what higher interest rates does to supply Mm. and new housing starts have gone down. And so in the long term, when you do eventually have lower interest rates and more demand, more immigration, and the need for housing goes up, you will have price appreciation because you have no other there's no other choice you're gonna have it's demand basic economics you're gonna have you know one property for 40 people that are bidding on it naturally the price will go up but do you think though on that point sorry interrupt on that point do you think that when the rates come down and demand increases and people sideline jump in the game do you think that when builders release their projects or start to release their projects with that heavy influx of supply, do you think that the prices are kind of, kind of, you know, um, average out, or no. do you still think they're going to be going through the roof? Or- no, they're they're still. If if that scenario plays out the way I think it is, it's still going to go through the roof because that was happening when rates were low. It's true. Every project that was getting launched, we're getting remember, sold out. you think that there's an influx. There isn't. That's that's the point I'm trying to drive across our audience here, guys. There isn't an influx of supply. If there was, you wouldn't have these this issue of supply. Even if you build 30,000 homes a year, even if you do that in Ontario, you're not going to achieve your targets. Plain and simple, you're bringing in 500,000 immigrants every year, every two years. They're coming. Those people need a place to live. Our generation, people born here that are growing up, getting married, they have families, they need a place to live. There just isn't really that answer, which is why, if you don't believe me, Listen to your uh, elected politicians, all of them, all of them, the current prime minister, the opposition leader of, of the opposition, the current premier of Ontario, all they're talking about is how to incentivize local municipalities, cities to build more because they understand what we're trying to tell you. There is so much red tape here, okay? 
that it takes a long time to develop a property. What does that mean? Develop doesn't mean to construct. It means to develop. So you have a raw piece of land. You have to go through this process. It's called the development process with the city so that you can now take that raw piece of land and create this vision of what that what's going to what it's going to look like on that land. Maybe it's 10 towers, 10 condo buildings, maybe it's a subdivision of homes, whatever it is, takes a long time. So for example, the prime minister or the leader of the opposition or the current premier what they're doing is trying to incentivize cities to say, "Hey, for every development that you approve and the amount of housing you create, we're going to give you federal funds or we're going to give you incentives to do that. And obviously they're going to developers and saying, if you could do this, if you could create more units, more density, more intensification, we're going to give you these kinds of you know, tax breaks or we're going to fast track the application process. And it's causing a lot of controversy within cities and against the city and the province mm-hmm. or potentially with the cities and the federal government. But they understand that we have a problem here. It doesn't take that long to build in America. It doesn't. It takes a long time here. And we know as investors, it's not about timing the market. It's about time in the market. So when you could buy something at today's price, but then it won't be built. Like, I'll give you an example. I'm closing a property now that I bought in 2017. Guys, it is now 2024. That's seven years I bought it seven years ago. I bought it for 440000 It's worth about 700000 today. Time in the market. I spent seven years to do that. Can you do that? Can you spend seven years in the market with your money tied up? I did. Even in this market, it's worth seven hundred. At the height of the market, when rates were low, it was worth about seven fifty dollars to eight hundred dollars So it's all about timing in the market. We have that unique problem here. So when you say influx of supply, it's not going to happen. You might think it's happening because you see this guy's launching a project and this guy's launching. Still not enough. Still not enough. We need a million homes by like 2030, six years from now. That's not going to happen. That means you have to build over a hundred thousand homes a year. That does not happen. Not even close to that. That does not happen. So that's my take on that. The way I see it is new challenges are creating new potential opportunities, especially for anyone that's looking to get in, especially right now, where there's an indication that the rates are going to decrease. However, the Bank of Canada hasn't decreased the rates. They held it the same. There is a lot of people right now that are still on the sidelines, which means there is still really good opportunity for those people that want to get in to get in right now before the demand goes to the roof again, just like it did in 2021, 2022, so on and so forth. So if you're somebody that's listening to this, need some guidance, some help, make sure to reach out to us, guys. We were on our socials at Matthew Ablican at Millennials Choice at Danny Ablican. We're the ones, we're looking at it. We're seeing our DMs. Everybody that's uh, leaving us Google reviews, uh, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Everybody that's watching this, listening to this, downloading this, we appreciate it. If you got any value from this uh, episode, just please make sure to drop us a, a like and share it with a friend or someone that's uh, can benefit from any of this advice. Um, I want to jump in yeah. before, before you close it. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's also very important to understand that you have to look at this from like a macro angle. You can't just look at what a realtor is saying and what the bank is saying because you don't know. There's so many factors that we don't understand that are playing a hand in all of this. And here's exactly what the governor of the Bank of Canada stated in their announcement this past Wednesday. With overall demand in the economy no longer running ahead of supply, governing council's decision of monetary policy is shifting from whether our policy rate is restrictive enough to restore price stability to how long it needs to stay at the current level. And basically, he did not rule out further hikes altogether, but he did suggest that they were unlikely if inflation and economic activity develop in line with the bank's projections. The Bank of Canada has its own goals. It's a privately owned entity. They have their own goals and they have the power to make these decisions. So at the end of the day, it's not smooth sailing ahead. You don't know that for sure. So I'm talking to some people that have, let's say, three properties and they literally are saying, what should I do? I have two properties coming up. 
I feel like I'm up to here in debt, but what should I do? Like, I don't want to sell. And then the market just spikes up. And I tell them what I'm about to tell you. Don't get greedy. If you feel like there's no ability for you to raise your income and you're already up to your neck in debt, if the market takes a turn for the worse, you're going to be in big trouble. And we know, guys, when it rains, it pours. You know, that's going to be one of your worries and you'll have so much more. You know, most marriages end in divorce not because someone is unfaithful. It's because of financial stress. That's the number one reason why marriages end. Don't get greedy, especially if you're listening to this and you do have a small portfolio and you do want to liquid. If you can liquidate something, you're going to free up your cash. Even if the market jumps, don't worry. The rest of your portfolio is going to do well. But at least if you feel that liquidating a property is going to give you kind of that breathing room, do it. There's nothing wrong with that. You're in the market. It's okay. And if the market crashes, amazing. You can now jump back in for a lower price and you sold it. If the market goes up, don't look at that. You, you sold, you made your decision and you have a portfolio now that's also going to increase with that. So I just want to like full disclaimer, I'm not one that just says it's only going to be positive. It's only going to be positive. I don't want to make that mistake. You never know what could happen. These guys are saying that we want to see, you know, uh, de demand is no longer running ahead of supply. What does that even mean? In what industry? What are you? What are you? What are they looking at? At the end of the day, we know cars are still expensive. I, I didn't see the price of cars really come down a lot. I saw no. real estate come down a little bit. I saw cars come down a little bit. I mean, gas is it came down. I, you know, Carson and I were talking that it was over two dollars a liter at one point. It came down, but it's still a dollar fifty. It used to be like 90, yeah. 80, 70. At one point, when I was a little kid, obviously we don't want to stick to that point. It was 49.9, the lowest I've ever seen per liter. But it's still gone up. It's still the high, like really, really high compared to what it was. So inflation's still there. It still happened. Is this a new norm that we have to get used to of these higher prices? Maybe. Maybe. But Ultimately, you guys, I don't believe in buying things like crypto. I don't believe in buying paper like stocks. I don't, I don't believe in buying certain things. So I want to buy stuff with utility. There's a lot of immigration happening. Check out one of our other episodes. There's a lot of demand for real estate. There always will be because people need a place to live. Exactly. Carson wants to ask a question. Yeah. So as of right now, because you believe the rates are gonna fall what are you kind of um suggesting i don't want to say telling your clients but what are you suggesting to your clients that they do now um if they're starting a new mortgage or renewing so it's obviously on a case-by-case -case scenario but for example if you're in a variable mortgage uh, like someone in my position where i've held it this whole time the when the rates come down uh you got to pick and choose a time of when to lock in if you're gonna lock in you might not want to lock in because, you know, you might want to just stick out with your variable. I personally think, you know, going back to what Matthew's point was, don't get greedy in this game. Um, that's the key lesson, I think, here for a lot of people. Um, for me personally, I'm going to pick a rate. Once we hit that rate and I can lock in, I'm just going to lock in and have that peace of mind for sure. It's definitely worth it, in my opinion. Again, depending on the person, some investors are like, you know what? I don't care. I'm going to keep it variable and keep it open, whatever the case is. Um, if you're looking to get a new mortgage... If you're getting a new mortgage right now and you're buying something, do not lock in to a five-year fixed. Do not lock in, in my personal opinion. The rates are coming down now. Now is not the time to lock in long-term. I think if you want to buy something now and gain equity, definitely do a one-year or two-year fix, in my personal opinion. Uh, but that's just what I think. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the reason why sales went up in December, one of the main reasons why is that fixed rates actually came down. So we did see that happen. That's not controlled by the Bank of Canada. Fixed rates came down on their own. So more people jumped in because the rates were lower. And that's a testament to what's probably going to happen when rates go down from the Bank of Canada side of things as well. That's probably what's going to happen. There will be that spike. So there's a few scenarios. If you're renewing right now, you've already, let's say you've been in a variable rate, you've already been at the highest it's ever going to be. Well, the highest it's been in the last two years. So you might want to leave it a little bit open for a little bit longer, I should say, and wait to see what happens this year. 
if you're closing a deal, like I'm closing three deals this year, I'm doing a six month to a one year mortgage on all of them. I'm going to, I'm going to roll the dice there because it's been two years of rate hikes. So exactly. chances are they're going to go the other way now. Chances there's are. There's indication that it is. Yeah. yeah. The, there's the, it's a higher probability that the rates will go down. So I'm going to leave it for a six month or 12 month term. I'm going to leave it in that term. And then once the rates go down, I will then look to lock in for a longer term. I always lock in you guys. I've never done variable. The one time I did variable, the guy put it in variable, even though I told him fixed and he literally had to switch it for me right away. And I still got the rate that I was guaranteed on the fixed side because that's what I wanted. He made a mistake. So I don't do variable. I like the peace of mind, especially as an investor. And then there are different strategies you could implement for paying down your mortgage quicker if it's a property that you live in or even on your investment. If you choose to do it that way, there are strategies like paying weekly mortgage, uh, weekly payments, lump sum payments, shorter amortizations. There's things you could do. But right now, if your mortgage is coming up for renewal and you could you could still afford the property. I don't see why you lock in for a long period of time considering it looks like the rates are going to go down. I don't think you should lock in for a long time. Nobody knows for sure. From a buyer standpoint, guys, take advantage because you know what you could do right now? You could buy a property. You could look and then you could buy a property that is going to be, you know, well-priced and you're well You could buy a power of sale property right now. I'm seeing them. I'm literally looking at some for myself and you could, you could buy, for example, I'm looking at a duplex, I'm not going to tell you where it is for it's listed with a lender that we know 450,000 for a duplex. Wow. So it's a rental property and you have two separate units, contained units, legal duplex. Like that's, that's great. Those properties are so, so good to have. They pay for themselves. They pay for themselves over the long run and 450 K like, what can you find for 450 K? Right. Yeah. So what I would do now is do a deal. There are sellers that are desperate to do a deal, especially when it's a lender that has more than one power of sale. This is key. Maybe we'll do an episode about this, just this. Um, And don't close the deal for 120 days. So if you buy it in the beginning of February, let's say of 2024, you know, you close it four months later, that brings you up to June of 2024. You're already going to see how the market plays out over that 120 day period, four months. That's a, a third of the year Yeah, gone by. That's a strategy right there. And you see where rates are. And then if you see that rates came down quite a bit, maybe you do lock in a little bit of longer time. Or if you see they're trajecting downward, keep it open and wait till they go down and then lock in. Damn, that, you're smart, eh? Not, not just good looks, <laughs> not bro. just good not looks. Not just good looks. Eh? <laughs> that was a key. That was a golden nugget right there, guys. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode you know, we always try to give you guys the best content, the best value and check out some of our other, other episodes where we talk about immigration, new construction, multifamily. We got a whole wide array of content for you guys and we want to hit a hundred thousand downloads by the end of 2024. So help us get there. God bless you guys. And we're out. We're out guys.